Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode two of Ingenious in 15. Thank you for um, coming back today. I'm here with Karen Thompson. Hello. She is a seventh grade ELA teacher at GR Whitfield. Um, we're excited to talk to her today. So tell me a little bit about your classroom. Okay, well, I'm here at GR Whitfield. I teach ELA and um, social studies, and I've got a pretty good mix of students um, that I'm working with, so I have to differentiate my instruction quite a bit, um, which has led to me to what we're going to talk about today, which is the workshop model that I use in my classroom. Awesome. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. It's still 415. May want to give people a couple more seconds to join in. Oh, 416. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So um, why did you decide to make changes to your schedule? Well, one of the things that I had that was a challenge at the beginning of my school year was having students being pulled out of my classroom and then having them come back in from their EC class and having to catch them up and having that time to help them with things that they missed. I also this year was introduced to a guided reading program and had to find a way to make that guided reading program fit into my classroom. And then also wanted to find as a personal goal of mine, find ways that I could work more with my students one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. And so that kind of has led to me to wanting to have that workshop model in my classroom. Can you tell me a little, this isn't on our question list, it just occurred to me, um, what is your block schedule time? Like how much do you have for ELA and how much do you have for social studies? And are those combined? Like how does your schedule work? I have 90 minutes for ELA and I have 45 minutes for social studies. So the workshop model is something that I'm just doing in my ELA class right now. Um, but within that 90 minute block, I have EC students that are pulled some are pulled during the first 45 minutes of class and some are pulled during the second 45 minutes of class. So I had to get really creative on how I was going to make that work in my classroom. Hence the let's try something new. Right. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, so how is your schedule different this year as compared to last year? Well, probably last year, my schedule was pretty much like everyone else's schedule, I would come in and have a warm up and I would teach my lesson. And during ELA, my students might get some independent reading time, which would allow me to have a few one on one conferences, but I definitely wouldn't have enough time to reach everyone in my room. And so that was something that I struggled with. But then as I started this new way of teaching, I found that I'm still teaching those lessons that I need to, those learning focused lessons that we have to for Pitt County, but I was designating half of my block just for working with students in small groups and in one-on-one -on -one situations. And so that really has allowed me to have more um, interaction with my students and really get to understand them more in terms of their strengths and their weaknesses. Awesome, well, yeah. let's, let's get into some more of the details. So, um, it's really amazing that you're able to touch and work one on one or in, in small groups with mm -hmm. every kid, if not on a daily basis, multiple times a week. Right. So how do you facilitate that? How is it organized? Well, that was really hard for me. It was a big challenge and it definitely wasn't something that I came in in August and knew exactly what I was doing. It kind of something that developed. Um, originally, I was doing more of stations and folders and getting the kids to, you know, look at the directions in the folder and complete this activity and using that time to pull students while they were working. And that became just a real challenge just because of the learning difficulties that some of my students had. And I needed something that was more, you know, everything in one spot, not so much movement, not so much work on my part right. in terms of putting together center activities or folder activities. And that led me to what we're going to talk about today, which is hyperdocs. Okay. So. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, a hyperdoc is basically any type of Google doc. It can be a Google sheet. Um, Google maps are really cool. I've seen Google sites, any, any Google package where you are um, adding links to learning activities and, and the students are following a learning progression mm -hmm. through that. Um, if you want more information on HyperDocs, um, feel free to contact me, um, or you can also check out the website HyperDocs.co. They've got it's a great website. Um, so 
if you don't mind, I'm going to pull up the hyperdoc okay. that um, the template that you use. And if you will talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. One of the nice things about HyperDocs is there is a website that has templates. So really the template that you're seeing right now is not something I created. I found the template. I made a copy of it just like you would any other Google Doc. And then really my only job was to put content within that template and make it available to my students. So the way I have my... Uh, lab activities set up. These, these would be the activities that my students are working on while I'm working with students one or one, one on one or in small groups. So I have a couple different sections set up. The students have access to this document through Canvas, which is another tool that I use in my classroom. And you can see my first box says guided reading groups. So each day I list which students I'll be working with in guided reading, which I feel like helps the students because there's never that question of, well, are you going to pull me today? They can look right at the HyperDoc and see who I'm going to pull that day for each of my classes. If you um, look below that, I always start the week with a lab activity one and a lab activity two. And you can see in my lab activity one box, I actually have several activities this is a working document, so I might start the week with just one activity listed up there. And as I see students are working through the activities, I might add more as the week progresses, depending on what I'm teaching. And my lab activity one is always going to be something related to what I'm teaching in my learning focus lesson plans. So right now we're working on poetry. We're, we finished up a narrative writing assignments. So you're seeing some different things my students are working on related to both of those things. And so they go right in there and you can see that there's several links. The links will take them to either the activity itself or directions or tools that they might need to complete the activity. And so these are activities that the students who are not in small group with you are working on. Absolutely. And you can see um, in red next to number three, I have a note to my guided reading group. So they only need to do a, a portion of that assignment. And that's because I have to be careful not to overload them with certain activities since they're with me twice a week during this lab activity time. So they're still held accountable for some of the lab activities. Uh, but then they also have some of the workload reduced because they're doing work with me in small groups. I also have a lab activity number two up here, which is always a vocabulary activity. And you could really do anything. Um, I've done grammar activities, anything that's just going to help support them in your subject area. So, but I found for me, the kids really didn't need me up there giving direct instruction every single day on vocabulary. So I developed a routine where they were working with our vocabulary for the week and doing something different with it Monday through Thursday, which are the days that they have lab time in my classroom. So each day they go to this and they're able to click and complete that day's activity. Some of them like to work ahead if they have time and they've got the option to do that as well. But the, adding the vocabulary was really easy because one of the things that was always so overwhelming to me about doing any kind of centers or stations or independent work like this was I've got to come up with the activities. And so being able to have something that was a standard and that I was just going in maybe changing the words or maybe a, a certain resource for that week. And then I was able to go and really focus on some of those other activities. The last section is a what to do when you're done. So if students finish both of the activities that I have posted, then they could come down and they can look at some other things that they could do and use their time with. Awesome. And I know that you use what's something called the Last Readers Program. Can you give a 30 second overview of that? Yes. The Last Readers Program is from an organization called Amplify, and I'm actually doing a pilot program this year. Um, it's the same company that does Read 3D for our elementary students, and it focuses on developing close reading strategies for students. Um, they go in, it's a role playing game. It plays kind of like a video game and also gives them practice with reading skills. Is it free? It is free. 
Sweet. Mm-hmm. All right. I will share the link to that in, um, on our Facebook page when this is over. Okay. So we're going to come back. I'm going to stop screen sharing and hopefully we will be. Ah, there we are. are. All right. Um, So you went over it a little bit, but what are some more of the different types of activities that you embed into this workshop model? Well, since I'm teaching learning focused lesson plans, sometimes I find that I spend more time on the actual activities and guided practice and students want a little bit more time with those assessment prompts. So sometimes I'll just tag an assessment prompt from my actual lesson plan on as a lab activity they can work on. Um, I also use Google Apps a lot. So a lot of my activities focus on Google Slides or link to other Google Docs. Um, Quizlet I use a lot, um, especially with my vocabulary. There's lots of different options you can use. My school also has Flowcabulary that's purchased, but you could really do something similar with Brain Pop or any other type of site that's going to give students access to content that you're teaching. Cool. Um, we don't have time to talk about it, but I'm going to share another link. She does something really, really cool with Google Sheets called Google Sheets, go, excuse me, Slides, Google Slides Sorts. That's really hard to say. <laughs> say it five times fast. Um, but I'm going to share that at the um, on our Facebook page as well. Um, underneath this video link. So be on the lookout for that. Um, So what are some lessons that you have learned along the way um, in changing kind of this to this model? Well, one of the big things that's happened is since this is something that I'm doing throughout the week, students are working on different things at different paces. And that was really hard. I'm very much a type A, want to be in control. Everyone's working on the same thing. So I kind of had to let go of some of that control and understand that, you know, really that student choice and everyone not finishing at the same time was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as they were engaged and they were being productive and achieving the goals that I had set for them, then, you know, that was okay. And it took me a while to wrap my brain around that and be okay with that. But you know, I think I'm there now and it's really working. All right. So you touched on one thing about the kids being engaged, mm-hmm. how and, and on task. Right. If you've got a small group over here at the desk with you, how are you keeping track of the fact that they are or are not working it, on something? It took a while to get a procedure in place. So definitely having clear expectations. I use Crostini. Um, in the beginning, I would have my own personal laptop at my small group with me and have Crossini up so that, you know, while my small group maybe was working on something, I could kind of glance over and see what my other students were doing and it maybe even send them a message or close out a screen to kind of redirect that attention. And so that was a big help also. Okay. And Crossini um, for Pitt County teachers, that is something that, you know, we provide for you. Um, so if your students are working on Chromebooks, that's definitely something that you have access to. Um, so get in touch with either myself or Beth Madigan um, to help you get that set up. Um, so how are you feeling? What what has been your reaction along the way with this? I I feel really good. I feel like, you know, my goal at the beginning was to have more time time with my students and to be able to learn more about them and implement my lessons and my guided reading in a way that was going to benefit all of my students. And I feel like doing it in this workshop mode using the HyperDocs has really allowed me to do that. So I feel like I'm on to something. It's still a work in progress, but I think I'm headed in the right direction. Awesome. What about your students? How do they feel about it? They they really have learned to like it because they're more independent rather than me standing over them and telling them what to do. They're forced to make choices. They're forced to set priorities. They, you know, it's really clear to me in their lab activities, if it's taking somebody some extra time to work on something, well, maybe that's somebody I need to check in with. And so I'm learning more about them and they're having that interaction with me and, it's giving me time to help them. And they like that feeling of getting help. And sometimes that help is not for me. That help is from somebody in their group. 
So they're interacting more with each other about the lab activities that they are doing on the HyperDoc. Awesome. Um, well, that is our time for today. Um, thank you so much for yeah, joining thank you. me. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you all for watching. Um, if you want to learn more about this, um, I'm going to nudge, nudge. Karen's, <laughs> Karen's going to submit a proposal for uh, TechFest on this. So um, you should definitely join us for TechFest this year. It's August 6th and 7th, mm -hmm. I believe, that Monday and Tuesday. Um, she will also share more about the different types of activities that she does. Um, just a reminder for you, um, the call for proposals for TechFest has gone out. It went out either today or yesterday through Info Info. So um, if you have some really great things that you're doing in your classroom, please share. We all want to learn from mm -hmm. you. Absolutely. Um, let's see. All right. So the template for um, Karen's workshop model, I'm going to share that on our Facebook page, as well as um, the, what's the reader's thing? The last readers. The last readers mm -hmm. link. Um, and then I'm also going to share a link of one of her Google Slides sorts um, mm -hmm. that I just am blown away by. It's so cool. <laughs> um, and then I hope you will join us next week. Same bat channel, same bat time. Um, we'll be here at 415. Look for our face onto our Facebook page for the link. I'm going to be talking with Amy Cooper about how she uses um, QR codes. So our Facebook page is facebook.com slash PCS digital learning. Um, did we have, oh, we've got some questions come up. I had Lucas says hi. I want to make sure hi, I say hi to Lucas. Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, and we hope to see you back next week. Okay. Bye. Bye.